Hello, everyone, and welcome to You File Your Taxes Your Way podcast. My name is Ida Celli, and I'm with uh, our very own tax expert, Jerry Vidaratis. Hi, Jerry. How are you? How are you, Ida? Not bad. Yourself? <laughs> good, good. Well, can't complain, I guess, you know, considering uh, we're all cooped up in the house. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Well, at least we're safe and sound. Exactly. And it's cold out there, so I don't mind it today. <laughs> True, true, yeah, yeah. In this kind of day, it's all nice to be nice and cozy uh, with a heated house. Exactly. So we're starting off a new tax season, and of course it has its challenges every year. So why don't you, uh, our topic today will be uh, how to get prepared and create our checklist for uh, get it, preparing our tax returns. So do you, what, would you like to start it off on, give us some tips and tricks? Yeah, sure. I mean, so it's basically a tax readiness checklist, right? I mean, I, so, so you know, we're, we're in a new tax season, right? Uh, you know, it, we're in a new year. Taxes will, don't wait for anybody, okay? And they, and they, and they never end, unfortunately. So, uh, so we have to get ready. We have to get ready for the next tax season. We have to get ready for preparing our tax returns. So what we're going to do, what I'm, we're going to look at is going to be basically, you know, how to get, how, the basis on how to get organized, okay? How to get ready for that tax season. So we'll start off with the basics, okay? Okay. So, and that means getting organized. All right. So what do we mean by getting organized is basically, you know, there's a lot of documents that come with the preparation of your tax return. So it's about organizing your documents properly in order to maximize your tax return. So by the basics and before I get into, you know, how to sort uh, all your slips and all the receipts that you have for your tax return, let's start off with a basic ground rule, what you should be doing at the beginning of every year. And what you should be doing is having a folder, a general folder where you stick any document that you believe might be relevant for your tax return. Okay, so whether you're debating whether it is or not doesn't matter. Simply put it in and you'll sort it later. So that's a habit that you should have at the beginning of every year. So right now we're in January 2021. You should have a folder, okay, ready made for 2021 in order to start putting in documents along the way. Now you might think, yeah, but it's not tax, it's not the tax season yet for 2021. Well, it doesn't matter. There are receipts that you get throughout the year and there are slips that you get only at specific times of the year. So for the receipts that you get throughout the year, for example, medical expenses or donations, et cetera, well, you should have that folder handy because this is money that you're leaving on the table if you don't properly archive those documents. Okay, now your slips you get in the following year around the first two weeks of March, okay, because the emitters of the slips have until the end of February to submit their slips to the CRA and to you. So it usually takes about, you know, one or two weeks after that deadline date of February 28th in order for you to collect those slips. But in either case, you should have that folder ready. Now, once we're ready to produce our tax return, we've got all of our receipts, we've got all of our slips, you should sort now these documents into three general piles. You will have a fourth pile, okay, depending on the type of income that you have, and more on that in a minute. Now, your first pile will be your income slips. So any income you made during the year you should put that in that pile. So you, you simply remove all the documents from that folder that you've created, and you now create that first pile, which is your income slips. So we're talking T4s, T5s. Uh, if you've got pension income, it could be a T4A OAS. Uh, it could be a T4 RSP or a T4 RIF. Uh, for those of you collecting, for example, some of the benefits that the government has paid out now, you might get a T4A as well. Okay, so these, these should be now in, you, these should be sorted into one pile. Now, for those of you who are self-employed, okay, whether uh, whether it is uh, you know you have you have your own business or if you own a rental property, then in that case you should have another pile just for the deductible expenses that you would have for those that particular income. Now, your second general pile will be your deductions. Okay, so these are expenses or receipts that you have that relate to deductions on your tax return. So the most common one we're talking about is RRSPs. Okay, so every RRSP you sh you receipt you have, that's that starts off your second pile. Now you could also have childcare expenses. 
Okay, so childcare expenses should be put in that pile as well. Uh, maybe you moved this year, well, maybe not likely this year, uh, but maybe you know you you moved during the year and you move closer to your employer. Well, then you are eligible for what's called the moving expenses deduction. So that that those deductions create your second pile. Now your third pile is for your credits, whether it's refundable or non-refundable. Okay, so the, this pile, usually what you will have is donations, you'll have medical expenses. Uh, if you're a student, you're going to have tuition fees in there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that pile should relate to purely your credits. Okay, now, why, why these three piles? And why do I, uh, do I sort between my deductions and my credits? Well, it's for one simple reason, is to be properly organized. When it's to essentially follow the flow of the tax return. If you have a tax return in front of you, okay, a T1 general in front of you, you always start by entering your income. You end up after you, you go then to enter your deductions, okay, your deductions which are taken off from your taxable income, and then finally you end up with your credits. Okay, that's the flow of the tax return. Therefore, if you create those three piles, you will now be able to produce your tax return properly and sequentially. Okay, and how will we make sure that we do have all the information slips, that we received everything before we start our tax return? So how you make sure uh, is, you know, one, one way of doing it is to have, first and foremost, to have uh, uh, your previous year's tax return on the side, okay? So you should always have a copy of your previous year's return while you're producing your current year return. The simple reason for that is a lot of our tax returns don't change as far as the type of information you enter in, the, in those returns. So because of that, you're, you're, you know, you'll be well served by having your previous year's return to make sure that all the information that you had last year will be there this year. So therefore, you won't have any omissions on your file. Now, another way to do this is also by having your notice of assessment. Actually, it's not even another way. It's an additional way. You should be doing both of these at the same time. You should have a copy of your previous year's return and you should have a copy of your notice of assessment. Okay. Now, your notice of assessment is the CRA's acknowledgement that they have received your tax return in the previous year and they acknowledge the return. Okay. So, in other words, they confirm the numbers that you submitted to them. Okay. Now, why is that notice of assessment so important? Is that one, you have confirmation of what your previous year's return was and what was in it. And two, you have certain amounts, okay, that you can use, that you've banked, quote unquote, that you've banked over the years that you can use to reduce your tax bill. And this is the concept that we call in taxation of a carry forward. So there are certain credits and deductions that you don't need to use all of them during a, a particular tax year. And you are allowed to bank them and carry them forward to the following year. Okay, so examples of this are, you know, tuition fees. That's the most common example. Mm -hmm. Okay, while you're studying, it's very likely you're not making a lot of income. And it's very likely that you didn't need your tuition fee credit to reduce your federal tax and your provincial tax to zero. Okay, you didn't need them. So those amounts don't get lost. You declare them in the year that you that you were studying and then you bank them for the following years. And then once you enter your career, you can now start using those amounts. Another example is RSP contributions. So your RSP contributions, you're not required to use them. You could contribute and you could bank the deduction to a future year. So all of these amounts will be found on your notice of assessment. Okay, the government shows them to you there. Okay, but if you don't have your notice of assessment handy, you won't know. Okay, you won't know you won't know whether you have those amounts and therefore you can grab them and use them. Okay, now a way you can get to your notice of assessment quickly and easily is by simply creating a my account portal with a CRA. So if you create an account with my account with the, with their portal, your notice of assessments are there and all your carry forward amounts are there as well. And we strongly urge you to use that, to, 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 to create that account. Very good. Very interesting. Now, how about uh, changes in our lives during the, during the year, like w whether we had a child, whether we got married, we got divorced or separated, how will that affect the tax return and why is it important to actually mention it or indicate it? 
Okay, so changes in your life, this would be a change in what the government will call your, mar your marital status. Okay, these are important. Okay, these are important to declare properly uh, to the CRA. Okay, the reason being that they affect directly specific credits on the tax return. Okay, they will profoundly affect them in the year where the change of your marital status happens. Whether you 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 have a spouse now, be it that you got married in the year or that you officially be, you officially have a common law status with your spouse, uh, be it whether you separated in the year, whether you were married and you separated or you were common law and you separated. There are specific credits and benefits that get affected directly in the year that that change happens. Now, on the credit side, there are two specific credits that get profoundly affected, okay, by your ch the change in your marital status. The first one is the spousal amount. It's a non-refundable tax credit. And the second one is the eligible dependent amount. So let's start with a spousal amount, okay? So the spousal amount, essentially what it is, it's a credit where you claim your spouse as a dependent, that's essentially what it is. So if your spouse's income is low enough, meaning that his or her income is below 13,000 and change, okay, then you start claiming your spouse as a dependent uh, as a credit. And basically you grab that 13,000 and change minus the net income of your spouse, the difference you claim at a 15% rate. Okay, that becomes your spousal amount tax credit. Okay, now, where this, where the marital status change affects this is, let's take both scenarios. You now have a spouse at the end of the year, which means you either got married or you were officially recognized as common law to the Income Tax Act. Now remember guys, common law and Income Tax Act are two different things, okay? Uh, when you live in a conjugal relationship with another person for 12 consecutive months, you now have a common law status with, and you have a spouse according to the Income Tax Act. So to the Income Tax Act, a common law and married is essentially the same thing, okay, to the Income Tax Act. Now I know in, in, the, in common law, it's not the case, okay, but in the Income Tax Act, it is. So this profoundly affects this credit. Why? Because in the year where I get married or I gain a spouse, but because we are officially common law, now I'm entitled for the first time, I'm entitled to the spousal amount, which I wasn't before. And again, I, 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 I base it on my spouse's income. Now, the eligible dependent amount, now in, in the reverse, excuse me, and this is ironic actually, on the reverse end, uh, when you separate in the year, okay, believe it or not, you are still entitled to the spousal amount. You can still claim that spousal amount. Okay, in the year of separation. All right, believe it or not. Okay, uh, now the way it works is that you claim your spouse's dependent based on their income, uh, your ex spouse, excuse me, based on their income up until the date of separation. Okay, so you have to prorate your ex spouse's income and you can claim the spousal amount. Now, there are also benefits that get affected. Two of them off the top of my head right now are the Canada Child Benefit and the GST credit. Okay, these are two that get affected by a marital status change. So both of these both these benefits are based on your family income. They're based on your income. So the more income you make, the less you collect. Okay, now in the year where you have a spouse, where you gain a spouse, whether it's through marriage or through common law, well, now you have to include your new spouse's income for the calculation of the Canada Child Benefit. Okay, so okay. you you have to do that now. For the GST credit, for the GST credit, it's the same. Th it's the same thing. You gain a spouse, so now your spouse gets added uh, in the collective pool in the family income. In the year of separation, you exclude your ex-spouse's income from that calculation for the Canada Child Benefit and the GST credit. Now, I believe I forgot one credit, which is the eligible dependent amount. Okay, in the year of separation. Uh, excuse me, let's take a year of marriage. Let's say you've got a mixed family, okay? I find my spouse, okay? And I have a child from a previous marriage, okay? So in the year that I become Kamala or I become married with my spouse, I'm still allowed the eligible dependent amount for my child, okay? And the reason for that is that the criteria for the credit is that uh, I have no spouse at one point in the year. 
which is the case. I became, I, I got, I, 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 ha, I, uh, I became married or I became common law during the year, which means for one day out of the year, I did not have a spouse. Therefore, in the year of marriage or in the year of common law, if I have a child that I'm bringing into the relationship, I'm still entitled to the eligible dependent amount. And the eligible dependent amount works the same way as the spousal amount, which is I, I take 13,000 and change minus the income of my child that is less than 18. Now, on the flip side, if I separate in the year, so I have, so me and my spouse, we have a child and we separate in the year, I'm still entitled to the eligible dependent amount in the year of separation because I meet the rule again. At one point in the year, I did not have a spouse. Okay, so at one point in the year, I did not have a spouse. Therefore, I still meet the criteria and I claim the eligible dependent amount. Now, last point on these credits, spousal and eligible dependent are mutually exclusive. I claim one or the other, but I cannot claim both in the year, in the year. Of separation or marriage. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, now, any other items that we should be aware of when we file our tax return? Okay. The other item that is often neglected, okay, within uh, the tax return is the foreign income uh, reporting. Okay. Or the foreign asset really reporting. Okay. So that's an important one. So essentially uh, what you have, to, so essentially the government requires you, the CRA requires you to, to declare, to declare in the year. Okay. Any foreign asset. So this could be uh, bank accounts. This could be uh, um, uh, ownership in foreign shares in non-registered accounts. Okay. So in other words, they're not in an RSP or a TFSA or real estate, for example, okay, is, an, is another example as well. If the combined value, uh, if the combined cost, excuse me, if the combined cost of those foreign assets is above $100,000 $100, Canadian at one point in the year, then you are required to declare this to the CRA. And you declare this through a specific form, which is the T1135, which U file supports. Okay, we have we have that uh, particular form in U file. Okay, so uh, so essentially now you, now it's not you're not going to get taxed on it if you're not making income off it. Okay, the point is that you still have to declare to the CRA that the assets exist. Okay, that you own them. Now the government has a simplified method of declaring these assets if the assets costs are within a hundred to $250,000. If you're within that threshold, then you simply tell them what type of assets you have. You don't have to, have to actually list them and go into detail as to what those assets are. But the moment you go above a cost of $250,000, now you have to list those assets in detail. They want to know what those assets are. Okay. And, you, if you, what happens if you don't report them and they find out? Well, you're you're really uh, you're really not in great shape. Let's put it that <laughs> way financially. All right. So if if you were to not declare these, okay, for whatever reason, well, now you are subject to penalties. This is not a tax; it's a penalty. Uh, okay, and the government will charge you a penalty that could go upwards of two and a half thousand dollars a year, and that is cumulative, which means that if you've been late filing that form and you were supposed to file it uh, since several years, you accumulate two and a half thousand dollars per year. Okay. So it's very stiff. So be mindful of this. Okay. Remember that also as you know, for example, shares in foreign stocks that are not in your registered accounts count for this a hundred thousand dollar threshold. They count. So even if you have a Canadian brokerage, it doesn't matter if you own uh, U.S. shares in a non-registered account, and the and the cost, the combined cost is over hundred thousand dollars. You are now required to declare those assets. Oh wow! Okay, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, what about installment payments? So installment payments is is an interesting uh, concept. Okay. So if we mentioned a bit about self-employment before, about having that little pile, you know, in order to have all your mm -hmm. uh, deductible expenses in there. So installment payments essentially is a means by which you can prepay. Uh, those self-employed individuals can prepay their income tax during the year. So unlike employees who have payroll taxes where they pay their taxes ahead of time. Okay. With 
with self-employed individuals, they don't prepay their tax. They would normally just pay it lump sum on their tax return. And that could be, you know, those amounts could be quite substantial, okay, uh, to pay one shot. So what the government has, has, you know, what the government has as a remedy to this is what they call installment payments. And installment payments, very simply put, they're quarterly payments of an estimate of the income tax that you're required to pay in the year. So this installment payment is important because they be, it becomes a refundable credit on your return. The government acknowledges that you paid that amount. Therefore, you're not going to pay lump sum when you file your tax return. And now the way you can get that information uh, is what we mentioned before, the My Account portal with the CRA. Now, normally the CRA would have submitted to you a letter that lists those installments. If you didn't get it, simply go to the My Account portal with the CRA and you can access that information there. A lot of things to remember. Uh, now, how important is to actually file your return? Because some people say, well, I have no income. I don't need to file. Um, you know, I'm 18. You know, why should I file my return? I'm still a student. Yeah, that's that's a very good question, uh, Ida. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't do it because, you know, the guide will tell you, well, if you're not paying any income tax, normally you're, you're not required to file a return. But that that's wrong. Uh, and the reason for that is now maybe legally you're not required, but the reason why you would still want to file a return is due to certain benefits that you can collect, which I mentioned before. Okay, I mentioned two of them. I mentioned the Canada Child Benefit and I mentioned the GST credit. If you want to collect those credits, if you want to collect those benefits, okay, remember what I mentioned before, they're based off of your income. If you don't file a tax return, the CRA has no way of knowing what your income is. And therefore they will simply not pay out those benefits. OK, so at the base, the government and remember that these two benefits are free. They're tax free. OK, they don't charge you any income tax on those benefits. OK, you're not they're not taxable income. So why would you refuse free money from the government? OK, it makes no sense. Go ahead and file your return, even if it's a nil return, even if there's zero income, file, you know, file your return anyways, because you will be entitled to some of those benefits. Now, another reason why you would want to file a return either way is when you apply for loans, for example. OK, whether it's a credit line, whether it's a, whether it's a car, whether it's a car loan, whether it is, a, you know, mortgage, a mortgage loan. Normally, the bank will ask you for documents proving what your income is. Okay, now without a notice of assessment, how can you prove it to the bank what you made? All right, so at that point, again, you're well served by filing your return. Therefore, you could have your notice of assessment to be able to apply for those loans. Okay, that's fair, fair enough, I should say. Uh, any last uh, tips or um, how do you say uh, advice you want to give our uh, listeners? I mean, listen, it's, it's, you know, sometimes the tax prepara tax preparation might be daunting. Okay. It might look daunting when you're, when you're doing the return, but remember that technology is on your side. Okay. Uh, now, if you create your account with my, with my, with the, my account portal, the CRA, which I mentioned before, well, now what opens up to you is what the government calls the autofill my return program. Okay. And with autofill my return, very simply put, using UFile, for example, okay, so UFile has autofill my return, you can simply import your, your income slips directly from the CRA into UFile and have it pre-populated for you. Okay, so you don't even need to input those slips. It's UFile that takes care of it for you through the autofill my return program of the CRA. Okay, so it's not as bad as one would think. Okay, when, when especially when, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the CRA allows you through us with through you file to be able to simply autofill your tax return to simply complete 80 to 90 percent of your entries for your tax return so you know don't worry uh it's not it's not as daunting as it might look to produce your own return you could do that easily through those kind of features very good but you need to also double check the information that comes through Right. Yes, absolutely. I mean, of course, because sometimes you might get an amended slip. Maybe your employer made a mm -hmm. mistake and they submit an amended one. You still double check. But at, but for the most part, again, you're getting essentially, you know, all the slips from the CRA and they're auto filled for you within you file. OK, so it's literally child's play to do. But in order for it to work, you have to have an account with my account CRA portal from the, from, from the Canada Revenue Agency. So make sure to mm -hmm. register for that as soon as possible. Oh, very good. Well, I think that pretty much concludes our first podcast. So thank you very much, Jerry. And uh, we'll hear for, uh, we'll hear from you again next time.
Absolutely. So. Well, thank, thank you very much. I hope I hope everybody enjoyed uh, the session. Now, uh, just be aware that uh, what we spoke about today, okay, the tax checklist is also found in our blog, okay, on our UFAL website. So www.ufal.ca or just simply ufal.ca. Sorry, I think I'm showing my age with a <laughs> www uh, over here. So okay. UFAL. Yeah, sorry about that. It's, it's just, it can't help it. Uh, so it's ufile.ca. Once you're on the website, you simply hover over the tips and tools tab. Okay. And once you're there, you're going to see an option for the ufile blog. So everything we spoke about today and more and a lot more details will be found on our blog. Okay. So again, on ufile.ca. And there's other articles, general, uh, general interest articles on taxation that you can find in the ufile blog as well. So don't hesitate to go to our website and check out those articles. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. So that concludes our first podcast. So till next time, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.